of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also wives ought to be in their to their husbands in everything. The first characteristic that I'm going to share with you about a ministering marriage is submission. We talk about that a lot because it's hugely important. It may seem redundant. Every time Josh talks about marriage, he talks about submission. Because you cannot have an effective marriage in Christ. You cannot become one without submission. You can't. Amen? You're like, you always got to bring this scripture up, the wives, you know? Right? They get uneasy about it. Listen, I didn't write it. God did. Amen? If he said it, then that's it. Good news, it doesn't stop there. Remember it said, subject yourselves to one to another in verse 21. Amen? That means the husbands subject themselves to their wives too. I'll explain that more in just a minute. He doesn't leave us, he doesn't leave us any room for pride in this. Amen? Pride simple. Is it not? Pride simple. So, we, <laughs> we joke around a lot, our small groups and stuff like that. You know, Luke's smiling because he knows what's coming. <laughs> Luke jokes around, you know, and I joke around with my wife. He jokes around with his wife, stuff like that. One of the ways he jokes with his wife, and I'm telling him because I know he won't care, is uh, if, they're, if they're talking, they're disputing or something, he'll say, Genesis 3.16. Right? Because it says that the husband's the head of the wife. You know, it's in charge of the wife. Right? That's what, that's what he points out. Now, if you were serious about that and it wasn't joking, which I know it is because he's my brother. I know that he's, he's joking about it. But if he were serious about it, then that would be prideful. Amen? Look at me. I'm He-Man. You're not. Right? You start like a He-Man and Woman Haters Club or something. Right? That's pride. Over and over, the Bible tells us to subject, subject ourselves, submit ourselves to others. Jesus led by example. Amen? Washing the feet of the person who was going to betray him. Submitting himself, even to him. Jesus gave us the example about submission. You can't have a oneness relationship unless you submit. Think about this. Jesus and the Father are one, right? We believe that? Amen? What did Jesus do before he died? He said, not my will, but yours. That's submission, is it not? Not my will, but yours. There's no room for pride in a oneness relationship. When you, when you are walking in one with, Christ, with, with your, your spouse and God. Total submission, that's what it means. Submission means that I put her hopes, dreams, and desires above my own. You have to put your hopes, dreams, and desires aside. Amen? On the side, so that theirs can be filled. I'm going to give you an example of that. A small example. Here's a small example. Last night, I woke up at 6 o'clock yesterday morning, which is early for a pastor. Let me assure you. Somebody said something about waking up at 5 o'clock. I didn't even know it came twice a day. Right? Because I'm out. 6 o'clock in the morning, I had to get up go go coach basketball. We were there all day. We played three games yesterday in a tournament. And if things go the way I want them to today, we're going to play three more today. Like, it was hardcore. Our kids were exhausted. Their coach was exhausted. I got home last night. Coaching's a lot like preaching because your emotions are wrapped up into the thing and, you know, you're on your feet the whole time, whole nine yards. So I'm sitting there. I've said that like three times today. It must be a crutch today. Whole nine yards. But anyway, so I'm sitting in the chair. I'm comfortable for the first time all day. If anybody goes to basketball games, they don't give you lazy boys. It's a piece of wood, or in this case, plastic. No back support, and it hurts. And I know you can't tell when I don't have my hat on, but I'm a large guy. And when you sit down, if you haven't heard that before, I've used it a thousand times. But anyway, so when I'm sitting on there, my back starts to hurt, right? And that was like game two, <laughs> right? So at the end of the day, I'm exhausted. Ashley says to me as I'm sitting in my chair, my chair is enormous, even for me. 
When I sit in it, I, you guys remember the big comfy couch with that girl that sat on it? That's how I feel on my chair. And it's comfortable. And so I'm laying there becoming one with the chair. And Ashley says, I'd really like to have cream soda right about now. So what does Josh do? To many of your surprises, I go over, I get my shoes on, I grab the keys, I drive down to the drive-thru, I get a vanilla cream soda, and I bring it back. Why? Because her hopes, dreams, and desires are more important than my own. I told you I'd give you a small example. It's a lot harder when it's a bigger thing. I assure you. But I'll give you a big example. I'll give you a big example. When we were going to go to college, Ashley and I went to college together. We've been together a long time, 16 years this year that we've been together. So when we're going to go to college, Ashley finished like top 10% of her class. She could go anywhere she wants, pretty much, right? But me, I finished bottom five. I really did. High school was, <laughs> I was more interested in partying and having friends and all that kind of stuff. I graduated like a 1.6 GPA from high school. Kids, don't do that. It limits your choices. Believe me. So I had to go to a state state school. That's public, you know, public school where I could get in, open enrollment type deal, right? She didn't have to. She could go somewhere and that's, you know, a better school. And she had the grades to get in and the SAT scores and all that stuff. Ashley, not 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 a lot of people know this, but Ashley's like four points away on the IQ scale from being a gene. For real, she's intelligent as she could be. She could have went anywhere. But we went to Shawnee State University. You know why? Because they, they would take me in. Right? That was Ashley sacrificing her hopes, dreams, and desires for me. That's cool. That's a big example. Right? That's, the, that's what we're talking about here. There are bigger things than you. Your spouse is one of them in God's eyes. Amen? That's how we're supposed to. I don't want to kick that horse anymore. Let's move on. Number two, verse 25. It says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. A number two characteristic of a ministering marriage is sacrifice. You've got to be willing to sacrifice for each other. Amen? Amen. And, and that we all, listen, and people get into these roles and all that kind of stuff you're supposed to play and other people are supposed to play. I just throw all that out because it'll just work itself out, right? When you know what you're willing to sacrifice to see to her comfort and her needs and her hopes, dreams, and desires, and you give that thing up, it's going to work out. Same in reverse. Amen? That's just the way it works. Ashley sacrificed a career to become mother of my kids. That's sacrifice, amen? That's how this works. That's how you become one. Josh, are you saying that you have the perfect relationship? By all means, no. <laughs> Not at all. As a matter of fact, my wife and I, sometimes we throw down. <laughs> I'm just being real. Right? I'm not the example, Jesus is. Right? Yeah, I'm glad you said amen. That means you get it. Right? But in the time we're willing to sacrifice and submit ourselves and give up things in order for our partner to do better or to feel better or whatever, then that's when the relationship just starts to work. And you notice the, you'll notice that about all the things that I'm going to mention. If you're doing the, the things that I'm going to mention, and it's a characteristic of your relationship, and it, it, it defines who you are, in your relationship, then your relationship is just going to work. It just works. Right? Any of you guys who've been married for a while know that what I'm saying is true. Then say amen so these younger ones will know. Amen. That's right. you got to sacrifice for each other. Jesus was willing to die for the church. For us. Right? We have to have that same mentality for each other. Amen? 
Listen, I'm going to tell you the truth. This is the God's honest truth. I take a bullet for my wife right now. And I can't say that there's ever been a time that I haven't felt that way. I love her that much that I give it up. And every man would probably say that about their wife. If you're following God's prescription. Amen? You've got to be willing to sacrifice for each other if you're going to minister to each other. That's just the way it works. You've got to submit to each other and sacrifice for each other. You know, submission and sacrifice are not the same thing, are they? However, one certainly can affect the other. Right? Because if you're willing to submit, then you'll be willing to sacrifice. And in a way, submission reflects sacrifice. Because you're giving something up. You're sacrificing yourself. Amen? For them. That's huge. Let's keep reading. Verse 26. Husbands, actually we'll go 25 and then 26. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. So that, so there's a reason for it. Amen? It's not just randomly. So that he might sanctify her. I almost said sacrifice, and that would be bad. <laughs> oh, no, we don't want anybody sacrificing their wives. <laughs> so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she may be, that she would be holy and blameless. The purpose for sacrifice is number three on our list of five characteristics of a ministering marriage, and that is sanctification. Sanctification. That is a characteristic of a ministering marriage, is sanctification. What is sanctification, Josh? I'm about to tell you. It's washing it, making it clean. Remember we talked about a few weeks ago that one of the, one of the properties that you have to have in a relationship that's growing together and all that, uh, uh, discipling each other and that kind of thing is uh, and, and even partnering, that you have to be uh, transparent and confess your sins one to another. Remember that? Well, there's a reason for that. So that they can be forgiven, but also so that you can work together, the discipleship part, and then in the end, be sanctified, which means made clean. That's why that happens. That's the progression. There's a, you think about this. I always think about it this way. That I believe... That when I gave my life to Christ, I am clean before the Father. Here's the reason. Because when God looks at me, He sees the blood of Christ. Right? I'm sanctified by that. I'm clean before the Father. I'm without blame before the Father. My sins are cast as far as the east is from the west. That's over. And I'm in good standing with God when I give my life to Christ. Amen? That's the way it works. That's instantaneous. The moment you give your life to Christ, that happens instantaneously. But then you've got to live it out. And that's the hard part because we're still wrapped in this skin bag, right? That's full of sin and all this, you know, natural, natural bent toward uh, transgression. You know, that's the natural way that we, we, uh, we lean is towards sin because of this body, Right? So every day, I strive with the power of the Holy Spirit to be better than I was the day before. Amen? So guess what? Tomorrow, my life is going to look more like Jesus than it does today. Amen? If I'm ridding myself of sin, and Jesus was perfect, sinless, blameless, then my life is going to look more like His. Day Today, today. That's progressive sanctification, which also I believe in. Right? And the only time that that is going to be done is when I finally, this heart quits ticking, and this brain quits thinking, and they put me in the ground. Because they can't put me in the ground. Because we don't die. We're Christians. We're Christ followers. We become with God and glory. Right? Forever. And at that point, that progression is done. It's completed. And we're, 
we're past it at that point. So why, why bring this up in the context of marriage? Here's why. Because when you minister to someone, when you minister to your wife, then the act of becoming one, by definition, her life is going to get better and look more like Christ from day to day to day. It's helping each other out on that road of progressive sanctification. Amen? Helping each other. So, did you know, husbands, did you guys know this? The Bible said, and it, I didn't write down the, the scripture, and I'm really bad with numbers, to be honest with you. That just the fact that you follow Christ, even if your wife was a non believer, she would receive blessings just because you're in the house and you're in that relationship. Did you know that? Well, it only makes sense because me and my wife, we love each other, right? And as a result, we're together. And if God blesses me, she's going to get some residual blessing. Amen? Think about that. Even if she wasn't following Christ, she's going to get some residual blessing from me following Christ. Right? That's the way it works. So imagine then, you're both following Christ. How much... Anytime I'm blessed, she's getting some residual blessing. Anytime she gets blessed, I'm getting some of that too. Amen? That's more blessing for everybody. Right? Guess what? Your kids are benefactors too. Amen? See, that's how God works. That's how cool He is. Isn't it? Like, see, that's sanctification and the, the process of sanctification is a blessing in and of itself, but it leads to blessing also. Amen? So when God loves me so much and he throws blessings on me, first of all, he does it in abundance. Right? This is what I imagine. This is what I imagine. Right? My son comes up and he's like, Daddy, Daddy, and we're at the pool and I take one of those super soakers and I dump it on his little head. If he's got anybody standing around him, guess what? They're getting wet too. Amen? That's how God is. Like a bucket, a blessing. Just, and then people that are with you, they're getting some too. Right? That's how sanctification works in your life. That's how it plays out. And then people start to see that. And then guess what? You're, you're ministering to people even when you don't know you are. Just because of who you are. And what you represent. And God blessing you. And they are in it. And you're walking with God. And you're in oneness with your life. And then guess what? They're looking at it and they're like, man, I like that. I want what they got. And you're ministering to them and you don't even know it. Sometimes, sometimes, your relationship, somebody else is going to be going through some struggles. And they're not going to want to tell anybody because it's a personal thing. But you, because you're a Christian, you're transparent, you're going to share your sins. Amen? You're going to confess those things. They're going to see you get through that. And then they're going to be like, you know what? I had that problem too. I need to deal with it the same way because they got through it. That's ministering, isn't it? Even when you don't know it. Because God's cool like that. Amen? You can be a blessing others, minister to people, even when you don't know because God is doing it through you. Let's keep reading. Where am I at? 28? Sounds good. 28. So husbands also, so husbands ought also to love their own wives. First of all, I'm glad that he put own. Right? There is no room for misinterpretation. Right? It doesn't say husbands love all the wives. Right? It doesn't say love many wives. It says love your own wife. Love your own wife. Right? All right. I just want to point that out. These little tidbits are awesome. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one has ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church, because we are members of his body. And here's the, the fourth point. Ministering, part of ministering, and when I say minister, the first word that comes to your mouth is what? Serving, right? That's the first word that I heard. That's the number four. You can't minister without serving. Right? Think about that, what he's talking about. He's like, listen, you should love your wife so much that you treat her just like your own body. Now, some of us have abused our bodies pretty handily. I'm being one of them. So, I mean, I, I feel like as a fat guy, i got to explain that. 
so we can move forward, right? But at the same time, I nourish my body. In fact, I would argue that I overnourish it. Thank you very much. But anyway, <laughs> Dan gets it. He's like, I I'm using that one. <laughs> yeah, you're good. I'm just joking. Uh, I'm not giving any excu excuses for gluttony. I'm going to put that stamp on that right now. But anyway, what it's saying, you, you love your own body. You love your wife just like you, you love your own body. Think about that for a second. Even if you have abused your body over the years with various things, you've still eaten, haven't you? Why? Because if I don't, I feel bad. Exactly. That's it. Think about that. It's profound. That's it. You're going to feed your wife. Amen. Because you love her. The reason you feed yourself is because you love yourself. I don't want to feel bad. Right? Or some of us, we just want to look good. So we'll exercise, we'll feed or nourish our body, eat whole foods and all that, any other kind of, you know, eat a paleo diet, whatever book you read today. That's usually the way it works. I've jumped on that fat, let me tell you. And I jumped off pretty quickly. <laughs> Going to be just fine. But you love her, so you nourish her. Think about this for a second. Not, it's not just talking about physical nourishment, even though it's giving a physical example that you love your own body. It's talking about, think about her, her, all of her needs. She has physical needs, for sure. Those are the easy ones to take care of. She needs a little water, go get some out the faucet. It's a lot easier here in this first world country than it is in third world countries, for sure. Amen? But even if you were in a third world country, your responsibility is to take care of your wife. Period. Her physical needs meet those. But also, her emotional needs. Amen? That's the hardest one for us, ladies. The hardest. One of the reasons why is because we can't read your mind. Men, it's okay to say amen. We can't read their minds. And then they, you ask them, what's wrong? Nothing. What are you supposed to? What do you expect me to do with that? Then I go sit in my chair, go back to what I was doing. Amen. <laughs> What's wrong with Ashley? Nothing. <laughs> no, something's wrong with her. No, but I asked her. She said nothing. I don't know what to do. <laughs> right? <laughs> but it's important for us. It, first of all, that's one of the things that keeps us together. Because if I knew everything about her, the mystery's gone. And I'm going to take the rest of my life to try to learn her. Amen? That's what we're going to do because that's what we got to do. Women, we have other issues. We know that. But for us, it's a communication issue. But it's, imp it's important for us to, to learn what their emotional needs are. And that, that, this isn't a one-way street. It's important the other way too. Amen? To take care of emotional needs when you can. Take care of physical needs. Take care of something that's even greater. Spiritual needs. How many, if I took a poll today, how many of you, and I don't want to raise it, I don't want to show hands, I want you to be honestly able to answer this. How many of you could say, my wife is, is doing fantastic at the big five, the big five things? Reading her Bible, she reads her Bible all the time. I see it all the time, I know she is. See, that's the easy one. Does she pray? Is she led by the Holy Spirit? Is she led by her emotions? What's she led by? Is she led by the Holy Spirit? Is she hanging out with people that are, that are god godly? Not the ones who say they are and the ones who go to church, but are they really godly people? Is she serving others outside your home? I mean, you think about those five things. If she's not doing one of those five things, or one of those five things are lacking in her life, then it's your responsibility as a husband to help her with that. Amen? So if you think about it, and you thought about it just now, well, I never see my wife reading the Bible, then it's time to get yours open and read it next to her so she gets fed. That's nourishment. Amen? Come to think of it, I've never seen my wife pray. Then get down on your knees, grab her little hand, and say, let's pray. you got to meet their needs. You would your own body. Amen? Serve each other. Serve each other. Women, everything I just said about men, just reverse it. Why to you? I don't want to have to say it all again. Okay? <laughs> let's keep going. Verse 31. 
For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great, but I'm speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife, even as himself, and the wife, and the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. Listen, I, I like the wording in the King James because it says cherishes instead of love, I think. But anyway, ultimately, that's what every woman wants, is to be cherished. Some of you may say, no, that's not, the only, that's not the main thing I want. Deep down, it really is. Whether you know it or not. They want to be cherished. Amen? So we should cherish them. You know what the one thing that the man wants, ladies? Respect. Those are the two things. He just sums it up right there. Love, cherish, and respect. That's the two things. And then, the last word, number five. This is what ministering couples, this is a characteristic. And that is that they have solidarity with each other. They become one. That's what solidarity is, right? I was struggling to find an S word, and that's the only one I could think of. Right? That's what ministering couples are. It, it, it marks who they are. That they love and respect each other. That's a hallmark of, of a relationship that's working. She's getting everything that she needs. I'm, you know, I'm getting everything that I need. And we move together. And, and then, if that's happening in your home, then guess what? It radiates out of your home. It, it, it pours over. It pours over. Even if it don't mean to. Even if it doesn't mean to. It still pours over because God blesses it abundantly. People see it. And it starts ministering to them. But here's the whole thing. You do want it to. You want it to spill over. When you're ministering to each other and your relationship is a ministry in your home, then you're going to be ministering outside the home. That's the way it works. And then you'll be practicing what James, the book of James calls pure and undefiled religion. Taking care of the widows and the orphans. That's ministry, isn't it? That's the whole point of this whole series. Is that I know that whatever happens in your home is going to filter out of your home. Right? If you're partnering together in your relationship and fellowship with each other, then guess what? You're going to do that outside the home. Amen? Your kids are going to learn to do that. And then they're going to go out of your home. And then that's going to multiply because that's what God does. God's in the multiplying business. Amen? That's what He does. If you are growing together and discipling one another, guess what? Your kids are going to get discipled too. And it's going to be your desire because you're going growing closer to God that you help other people grow closer to God that aren't inside your home. So it filters out. If you're ministering to the people in your home and they're getting their spiritual needs met and their physical needs and their emotional needs and all that stuff, psychological needs, throw anything else you want to throw at it. If it follows with needs, it's your job, right? and those are getting met, and you're becoming one with each other and one with God, then you're gonna, that's going to spill out because you're going to minister to other people. Intentionally, because that's what you want, because that's what God wants. Amen? Not my will, but yours. That's the way this whole thing works. So basically, what we become is little ministries who go out and minister, who create ministries, to go out and minister, and then God's hand, His unseen hand, is working all throughout the world. And it starts with you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, my earnest prayer today is that we would minister to each other. That we would be, we'd be willing to, to put ourselves to the side Submit to one another. Serve one another and all the other essence that I talked about today. I thank you for this beautiful scripture that you've given us to help us in that endeavor. But Lord, I pray that if there is an area in my life that I'm not meeting Ashley's needs, that Lord, you would convict me of it. Convict me in such a way that 
It leads to repentance. And I would turn away from that thing and help it better. I know there's a ton that I'm missing. There's a ton that I'm lacking. But Lord, I know with the Holy Spirit, with the power of the Holy Spirit, with your, your touch, it can be made whole. Lord, that's my prayer for everyone in this room today. And anybody watching online. Lord, that they would become one with their spouse in a ministering home that would minister to each other and outside of those walls so that, Lord, ultimately, you will be glorified through that relationship. Lord, I pray for anyone here that isn't meeting the needs of their spouse that you would convict them as well. Convict them in such a way that it wrecks them, that it gives them, that, they, that it leads them to repentance. And that they would change. And then watch the effects that it has on everything that's going on inside their home. Lord, I also pray that there's one here that doesn't know you as their Lord and Savior, that has never received that free gift of salvation that you so graciously give us. Lord, I pray that they would be broken today and that they would give their lives to you. Their whole lives. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you need to come forward, you can come.